Good afternoon. First off, I'd like to thank Kat for inviting me here today, and I hope she's feeling better. I'd also like to thank the Rotary Club of Pasadena for allowing me to speak with you this afternoon. It's an honor and a privilege to speak to such a prestigious organization, especially one whose values align with my passion as an environmental educator. I'd like to take a few minutes to very quickly share with you how I became an environmental education advocate. I was born and raised in Wyandotte, Michigan, a suburb of Detroit, where I was a sports fanatic. Earning nine varsity letters in high school didn't leave much time for nature. I was a Boy Scout for a couple years. That and summer fa family fishing trips to Houghton Lake were my closest connections to nature. I accepted a football scholarship to a small rural college, West Liberty, in West Virginia, where I was surrounded by nature. I wanted to be a football coach, so naturally I majored in science education. My environmental studies class had a big impact on me. My first environmental stewardship project was helping to reintroduce native fish into the Ohio River. I moved to Southern California in 1977. Now my wife and I live in San Pedro. I think daily how appreciative and grateful I am for being able to live in this beautiful Southern California Mediterranean climate, especially when you look at the increasing numbers of devastating, extreme weather events happening all across this country and the globe. My teaching career began in 1988 in an extremely low-performing school in South Los Angeles, Fauche Junior High. In fact, it was being threatened with a state takeover. In 1989, a new principal was assigned and started the transformation into the fabulous Fauche Learning Center, a K-12 school that became a national model for reform, with the high school ranked as one of the top schools in the country. The process of being part of that transformation taught me a lot. It taught me about teamwork, thinking outside the box, and it taught me about the importance of building upon the shared values of the entire staff. We all believed that all children can learn, and all children deserve the best education possible. My teaching style incorporated project-based learning. Experience is a great teacher. You learn by doing, and you learn by teaching. Growing food with no soil through aquaponics, researching the efficiency of hydrogen fuel cells, and designing, building, and testing wind turbines. And if you're an engineer, you know, repeat again. We'd like to take meaningful field trips, like to a water treatment plant where by chance a Fauche graduate was working, and out to sea with Mal Algalita Marine Research Team, learning about ocean plastic pollution from the experts. And my zoo, where students researched, cared for, and taught about animals of their choice. Many of my projects resulted in peer teaching opportunities. This is where some real learning takes place. I like to think I help students to become responsible, to learn about career choices, and to be confident they have a future to believe in and one that they can contribute to. In my first or second year teaching, I was introduced to Project Wild. I was so impressed with the program and curriculum guide, I immediately got trained to become a facilitator, and then also for Project Learning Tree and WET. My thinking was, and still is, that interdisciplinary activities and units were perfect for every teacher in elementary and middle school. Teachers from different disciplines working together and students learning in context. In environmental education, we talk about food chains and food webs and how all the parts of the planet, including the living and the non-living, are connected by the web of life. Breaking down silos is critical to working, not only in education, but in businesses and in communities. That sentiment is expressed on the Rotary website by this statement taken from We Work Differently, quote, we see differently. Our multidisciplinary perspective helps us to see challenges in unique ways, end quote. That is true in environmental education too. I was privileged to be part of the beginning of the GLOBE program in Los Angeles, Global Learning and Observations to Benefit the Environment, where researchers train teachers and students to collect local environmental data on air, water, soil, weather, and much more, and send it to the researchers who actually use the data. All of this was helping students to a better understanding and appreciation of nature and also man's impact on it. But something was missing. I met Dr. Jane Goodall in 1996 as she was introducing her Roots and Shoots program into the inner city. 
I arrived early for her talk in the teacher's cafeteria. She sat next to me and sorted through her slides. We connected as we talked about my classroom animals and environmental education. I even got a picture taken with her. A few weeks later, I received an invitation to volunteer for the Jane Goodall Roots and Shoots program in Tanzania for three months to learn about Roots and Shoots, a program based on students doing stewardship projects. It's a long story how I was able to pull it off, but with the support of my principal, students, and teachers at Fauché, as well as the LAUSD science branch, and especially from my wife, who was left at home for three months while I went to Tanzania. While there, I spent most of my time living in Jane's home in Dar es Salaam. I learned how Roots and Shoots started with Jane and just a few high school students on her back porch there, where I was staying. While there, I got to participate in stewardship projects and learn how young people in Tanzania were trying to make their community better. Roots and Shoots does start with a focus on your local community. I was fortunate to be able to spend a whole week in Gombe with the chimp researchers, going out and following chimps every day, and that was an incredible experience. Roots and Shoots is now in every state in over 60 countries. Upon my return, my wife and I helped to start the Roots and Shoots Base Camp, a group of volunteers dedicated to develop, grow, organize, and better define Roots and Shoots. We're still active today. So you might be wondering, what is Roots and Shoots? Well, the Roots and Shoots mission is to foster respect, passion, and understanding for all living things. But for me, this next part of their mission was what was missing for me. Connecting what I was teaching and what my students were learning with meaningful stewardship projects in the community and or on campus. Each group is asked to do three stewardship projects, one for animals, one for the environment, and one for the human community. And all projects are student-led. Students learn about and how to better participate in their community. Developing a community map from either using paper and pencil to using Google Maps, that's used to identify areas of need in the local community. In the South LA community, issues like graffiti, pollution, healthy food, and homelessness were identified as needing attention. Student leaders are in charge of developing community partners, getting donations, contacting city government for support. They're in charge of planning the project, the work schedules, the timelines, and everything else that goes with doing a project like this. The young people of Roots and Shoots are developing skills to help them become the leaders of tomorrow. So project examples for animals include my classroom zoo, which was full of exotic animals confiscated being smuggled into the country illegally. We rescued the animals, the students became the animal caregivers, and the students developed research papers and presentations about them. And the animals became ambassadors for environmental education, a butterfly garden restoring lost habitat for pollinators, and native plant drought tolerant gardens are also a habitat for local wildlife. Projects for the human community include planting trees. Tree planting is not just an environmental issue. Trees are needed in urban settings. Think about the impacts of urban heat islands. Another great thing about Roots and Shoots is that it promotes partnerships. I'm going to show you a short public service announcement from, from the Roots and Shoots 2008 Global Youth Summit for a couple reasons. One, the use of video and PSAs are a great way to educate and get the word out to a mass audience. We do now live in a social media world. I chose this particular PSA because of Rotary's great campaign for clean water around the world. Now the students at this summit were from all over the world. They were put in random groups. They didn't know each other. They were given a free video cam, trained for an hour or so, and given one day to produce a PSA. And this is what one group came up with. Natoka Tanzania, Kigoma. I live in Boston, Massachusetts. I live in Guelph, Ontario, Canada. My name is Guelph, Ontario, People in my community pollute water. In my community, corporations are taking our water. Look into your community. 
pada di generasi bijemian. And then see what you can do. And see what you can do. Okay, so projects for the environment and groom include a team from Santa Monica called Team Marine. Ben Kay, who's a good friend of mine, is an amazing environmental educator there, and he's a surfer. He and his students are always doing something to clean up the ocean, educate about it, and lobbying local governments to make changes to help. My class started recycling to reduce plastic pollution on campus and to raise money for hydration stations and reusable water bottles. And we learned along the way, as we reduce our use of single-use plastic, which is made from fossil fuels, we were also reducing our carbon footprint while helping to combat a warming planet. On the Rotary website, under What We Do, the first bullet is Promote Peace. For Roots and Shoots, we've been creating peace with the human community, the environment, and animals through our stewardship projects. It's a holistic type of peace. It's not just about guns, violence, and war. United Nations Peace Day is on September 21st, and that's the day Roots and Shoots celebrates the projects we've completed. Here in Los Angeles, Roots and Shoots groups from all over Southern California put up displays of their projects for the purposes of not only celebrating their accomplishments, but also to educate and inspire others. And yes, that is Daryl Hannah. Also displays by like-minded organizations, promoting projects and recru recruiting groups who are interested in projects in those areas. Local supportive politicians also showed their support. The first Roots and Shoots Peace Day in Los Angeles happened in San Pedro in 2004. We had about three schools and less than 100 participants. Thanks to Councilman Tom LaBange, we were invited to Griffith Park. He also provided a stage for three years. We landed on Santa Monica Pier after they invited us to bring the event to the pier at no cost. We had about 10,000 participants at the final large day of peace celebration in Santa Monica. Roots and Shoots helps us to create a holistic peace through stewardship projects locally and internationally. Our Peace Day event is a success story of how just a few people with shared values working together can make a big difference with passion, persistence, and teamwork. So how many of you really want to leave the planet a better place for future generations? I do, and that's a value we share. Roots and Shoots, Rotary, and Environmental Education share the same causes, the same values, and the same goals of making a difference and leaving the planet a better place for future generations. Here's a list of Rotary, what we do, and the Roots and Shoots action goals. I see a lot of overlapping areas, all in line with our common goals of leaving the environment better for future generations. And the goal is for long-term solutions, for the common good, and most importantly, with all working together. As an environmental educator, I recognize the connections between the natural and the built environment. They're not separate, and neither are we. We are but a strand in the web of life. Currently, there is an ominous environmental humanitarian concern that is having an impact on the planet and making it harder and harder now and in the future to leave the environment in better shape for future generations. That's a warming planet. My wife and I saw former Vice President Al Gore tape his slideshow that became the Academy Award and Nobel Peace Prize winning documentary, The Inconvenient Truth. He announced he was going to train presenters. I applied and I was accepted. I saw this as an opportunity to add another tool to my environmental toolbox. In fact, I looked at it as a unifying call to action around something that is impacting so many facets of our lives and touches so many different science and educational components. I quickly became one of the top presenters in the world, mostly talking to students in classrooms across Los Angeles. I'm not here to do a detailed climate presentation, but if you'd like to set one up, let me know. But I am going to talk about talking about climate change. How many of you parents out there had the talk with your children? I know it can be difficult and awkward to approach that sensitive subject, but this obviously is not going to be the same talk, but maybe just as consequential. 
So what are we going to talk about? And what are we not going to talk about? Well, we will talk about the shared values of protecting the environment for future generations. I love teaching and learning about the environment, so this really hurts me to say that we will not be talking about the science of a warming planet. Catherine Hayo, a Texan conservative, is a professor at Texas Tech and one of the most respected climate scientists in the world. She gave a TED Talk where she quoted the Yale Program on Climate Communication Public Survey, stating that 70% of the people in the U.S. believe the climate is changing and will harm plants, animals, and future generations. 60% believe it will affect the U.S., but only 40% believe it will affect them personally, while two-thirds of the respondents conceded they never talk about it. She says that is the most important thing that we're not doing, is that we are not talking about it. Well, I am here today talking about it, and you should leave here today ready, willing, and able to have this talk, too. I took a class from the National Network of Ocean Climate Change Interpreters on how to talk about climate change. Catherine Hayhoe uses the same phraseology. Start with the heart. Start with shared values. What's at stake and why it matters? It gets people to care. Of course, we have to have common sense steps to address environmental issues and protect people and places from harm with reasonable, realistic solutions. And she says, we've been talking about the data and evidence for over 50 years, and that message is turning people off. So we will not talk about catastrophes, which are bad news and received as scare tactics, and some people only seem to care if there's a direct impact on them. We're not going to talk about data and graphs and numbers. We're not going to use scientific jargon, those big scary science words. Instead, we should use explanatory metaphors like heat trapping gases instead of greenhouse gases. And I don't talk about tipping points because to me a tipping point insinuates a point of no return and no hope. And I wouldn't be here if there was no hope, would you? What we talk about and how we say it is the key. So what impacts do a warming planet have on our basic needs, like food, water, shelter, and our health? This is a slide from one of the climate reality presentations. Each system has several slides that details the impacts, some of which we are currently experiencing. And as I said earlier, I'm not going to give you an in-depth climate talk, so I'm not here to go into all those details today. But I am going to look at these systems from a more local perspective and show examples of stewardship projects that help to mitigate them. So food supply, what's the problem? Well, one of the biggest global issues is the inequity of access to healthy food. And those who have, have too much and they waste it. In the United States, about 25% of what ends up in landfills is wasted food. The EPA estimated in 2018 that 68% of all wasted food ends up in landfills, equal to about 48.8 million tons. Locally, where I taught in South LA, it was characterized as a food desert with few healthy food options and lots and lots of fast food. Fast food. Our, our community map clearly illustrated this issue. We started a school garden and had a classroom aquaponics partnership with USC and discovered a community garden near USC that sells fresh organic produce to the local community. Many other teachers have their own success stories. So water and global health, what's the problem? Well, water is the limiting factor for life on Earth. Jane Goodall told me years ago that all the wars of the future will be fought over water. Just Google water wars to see how true it is. Water extremes of drought and flooding are being seen more often now, each causing different issues. Drought leads to no water for people or plants. People end up deserting, emigrating to another country. They could and should be classified as climate refugees. And if you think that's not a local issue, look south to the border. Flooding leads to no potable water with reduced or no crops and an increase in waterborne disease. My good friend Michael Winters was a career tech educator at Gabrielino High School. His environmental technology class was his combined Roots and Shoots and Interact club. He was also the headmaster of a school in Lahore, Pakistan for the Roshana Foundation. 
We taught Project Sweat and Project Learning Tree to the teachers there via WebEx. Michael and his students collected and recycled over 870,000 containers from school, from the Rose Bowl, the Rose Bowl Parade, the LA Marathon, just to name a few. Fundraised from the recycling, along with matching funds from the local Rotary in San Gabriel, and both the regional and international Rotary, along with Life Straw's generous support, was used to buy over 4,000 Life Straws to send to earthquake devastated Haiti, a Tanzanian refugee camp. And when Pakistan flooded, Michael delivered Life Straws to Pakistan himself. One Life Straw can filter enough water for one person for an entire year. It filters out bacteria, parasites, and microplastics, greatly reducing waterborne diseases and dehydration. Life straw should be part of every emergency preparedness kit. Now doesn't that sound like a worthwhile project? My question to all of you is this. Do you have your emergency preparedness kit ready, set, go? No matter if it's earthquakes, tornadoes, flooding, fires, or whatever type of natural disasters impact your community, you need to be prepared. Now you've heard about and seen examples of stewardship projects making a difference while developing leadership and life skills and a sense of accomplishment in young people, and most importantly, giving them hope for the future, one that they can help shape. You also saw examples of how Rudy supported the Life Straw Project, and hopefully now you've seen some new ideas and different ways in how Rotary can make a difference for future generations. I'd like to share a quote from my dear friend, Dr. Jane Goodall. Quote, Above all, we must realize that each of us makes a difference with our life. Each of us impacts the world around us every single day. We have a choice to use the gift of our life to make the world a better place or not to bother. You wouldn't be here if you thought it was time to not bother. Now is the time for action, not inaction. Together, we must do everything in our power to make our home, Earth, a better place for future generations. Our planet and future generations depend upon it. For more information about any of the programs I talked about, about Roots and Shoots, Environmental Education Training for Teachers, um, you can contact me at my email here. I also have cards up here for anybody who is interested. But for now, I'd like to thank all of you for what you have done in the past and what you are currently doing and what you will do in the future. Just remember, we are all here to make a difference and leave the planet a better place for future generations. And together, we can. Thank you for having me here this afternoon. Have a safe and happy holiday season. I'll be available for questions after.